Amen. Welcome to the house of God this morning. Let's rise to our feet and let us sing together this song. God is good all the time. Let us rejoice and sing and clap our hands together. Amen. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good.
Yes, we trust. Hallelujah. We will trust. Yes, we will trust. In you, we will trust. Hallelujah. We will trust. Yes, we trust. In you, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give God the praise and glory this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, oh God, for your love, the Spirit, oh Lord Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, O God, for this morning. For that we can worship you and praise you, O Lord Jesus. Sing unto you, O Lord. Hallelujah. Fill this place with your spirit, with your presence, O God. Hallelujah. We worship you. Sing this next song. Sing this next song, Kuma Wuchinta Yes.
Through the help of the Holy Spirit, we approach you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we come before you and uphold our leaders in the fellowship, especially Pastor Joe Campbell. We bring him before you right now in Sydney, Australia, and we uphold him in prayer, God. We pray for your healing power to begin to rest upon him. God, resurrection power in Jesus' name upon his entire body. In Jesus' name, we commit, O oh Lord God Almighty, hallelujah, all the area pastors before you and all the leaders before you as well, Pastor Great Mitchell, Pastor Ellen Asia, and the area works they're represented in this nation. We bring them before you, Pastor Trevor Fong in Sabah, bringing Pastor Gregory in USJ, and Joel in Puchong, Pastor Ku in in Kupong, in the name of Jesus, and myself, and all of us before you, and we pray, God Almighty, you shield and begin to cover and protect each and every one of us. We ask of you, especially from the spirit of deception. We understand the devil is a liar in the last days. The Bible says even the elite will be deceived. But we pray, Almighty, that your people and we who serve you god almighty will not be deceived we will be protected this morning in jesus name we to uphold sister angie who's not well and we pray for her lord uh, recovery from a sickness 
bringing Biola as well before you and bringing all your people whom you know is not well. And we pray, God Almighty, that you are Jehovah Rapha and that you will touch and bring healing. This morning, we want to also bring this coming uh, Saturday morning. The, we are doing a community service here on at, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we pray for all of us who are helping out to serve in that area of ministry. That God, you will use that time to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, we also uphold the coming October meetings with uh, Evangelist Richard Graham. Even as he comes all the way from Texas, we pray, God, Flight Journey Mercy, and we pray for the five meetings that he will have with us, that you would, God, glorify your name, souls be saved, and hallelujah, healing takes place, miracle takes place. As he travels to Sabah as well, bless the meetings there in Sabah in the name of Jesus. Oh God, we thank you for this morning. Those who are not here, we commit them to your hands. We pray wherever they may be, Lord God Almighty, uh, shield them, uh, be with them, God. And this morning, those who are here, they have needs in their life. Lord, even before we ask, you know, when we pray, that Almighty God, that you begin to just Touch your people here and bless your people here. Hallelujah. In Jesus' most a great and awesome name, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give a big clap for the Lord and turn around as we sing a song. Hallelujah. This morning and wish one another. Hallelujah. The Lord is here. Lord. faithfulness in serving in in this area of ministry the music ministry amen so um, giving you the church announcement um, this coming Saturday uh, morning um, we're gonna do our first uh, community service uh, project okay and um, uh, we're gonna clean the area that is around this uh, entire uh, building, PV128, and then also uh, the bus stop area. And um, we're going to be, in a way, as Sister Rita always says, spiritual alum floras. Okay? And so this is the vest that we're going to put on for those who are uh, involved and uh, the back here is this, the Victory Fellowship Church and Volunteer Community Service. So we'll be putting on this and, and uh, at uh, 9.30 we meet here and we will have a briefing by Brother Liu 
who is the leader of this uh, community service. So at 9.30 we meet here and, and uh, Brother Liu will brief us in regard to certain things. And after at 10 o'clock we will be uh, going around here to um, clean up the area here. Okay? So we got the, Brother Liu has got the things, um, the, I don't know what you call that, gadgets already at the uh, pantry area. Uh, for uh, that morning, okay? And then um, uh, the next project we are talking about is to do uh, what you call, uh, we're looking at the blood donation drive and see whether we can have it done here. So um, our first project will be this and we meet here at 9.30 Saturday morning. Next Saturday is a, is a holiday, right? It's Malaysia Day, I think. It's called Malaysia Day. So uh, you're invited to join. Okay. So if you're coming, do let Brother Luke know um, uh, if you're coming. All right. So Richard Graham will be here on the 4th. Uh, sorry, on the 3rd. He'll be preaching for us on the 4th. That is Wednesday night. And then on Friday 6th, he'll fly to Sabah. And then he'll be doing revival in Sabah Sunday morning, Sunday night. And then uh, around to Wednesday, he'll be there and then he'll fly back here. And then he will begin a revival with us on uh, Friday night, uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning and Sunday night. Okay? And then he'll fly back on to Texas uh, on uh, Wednesday. Okay? So I do uh, ask that you uh, pray for these meetings and as you have been praying for these meetings and I do also ask you to pray for the um, finances to hold this meeting with Richard Graham. Um, it will cost like four to five thousand dollars to have him come. Okay? So we are taking care of his hotel stay. He's staying here like eight nights uh, eight nights so after the service we'll be probably going up to see whether the upstairs hotel hotel seat will be suitable for him to stay okay but uh, he'll be staying for eight nights and um, we'll be taking care of his food every day okay we'll be giving him food money also in his hand spending money for uh, him and also at the end of the services, we will also be taking care of his offering. Okay, so we'll be providing for that. So I ask you to pray for these uh, finances to take care of this entire meeting that we're going to have with Evangelist Richard Graham. All right. So amen. We're going to bow our heads and we're going to go before God with our giving this morning. And. Um, Amen. Let's, let's pray, ask Brother Luke to bless the offering this morning. going to turn to Acts 11 verse 26 Acts chapter 11 verse number 26 If you could uh, rise to your feet, we're going to read just one verse in verse 26, okay? Acts chapter 11 and verse uh, 26. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So he was there for a whole year, assembled with the church, 
and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Bless this morning's service, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we also want to welcome those who are watching through live stream this morning. Amen. And again, uh, so blessed to have you all here for this uh, Sunday morning service tonight. We have service at 7, uh, 6 o'clock is the prayer. The title for this uh, morning message is very simple. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a very important uh, title. That is the title, Who is a Christian? Okay. The title is, Who is a Christian? Now in the verse that we have read this morning, we have with us the word Christians use for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. It was in the city of Antioch, a town, a city that you will find mentioned time and time again in the book of Acts. But anyway, it was in this town called Antioch that the word Christian appear for the first time. Okay. For the first time, this word Christians appear and appear in the town or in the city of Antioch. The scripture says there, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The other times, the word Christian appear in singular, and that is in Acts 26, 28, whereby in Acts 26, 28, it says, then Agrippa say to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. That is in Acts 26, 28, King Agrippa says to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. The, another time in 1 Peter 4, verse 16, uh, used by Peter, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. But in any case, the first time the word Christians appear is in Acts 11, 26, in a city called Antioch, 300 miles north of Jerusalem, that has a population of uh, half a million people in that city, and not in Jerusalem, not in Judea, Samaria, but the first time this word Christian appear in the city called Antioch. Now all of us here are aware and heard about the law of first mention. And um, what basically the law of first mention is, is it is about the first time uh, something is mentioned or something happens or the first time something took place. For example, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, when the devil is mentioned, he's mentioned as a serpent first time. And in that, the first time, when he was mentioned, he mentioned his way of causing people to disobey, disobey God. And, and that is, he uses the method of deceiving them. He uses the method of lying to them. Okay? Lies and deception, it tells us because that's the first time that the enemy uses to deceive Adam and Eve whenever there's a disobedience, whenever there's a sin, it tells us that the first thing he will use, okay, the first method he will try to use is he will use lies, he will use deception. So from the law of first mention, we can begin to determine from that first mention, uh, in this case, uh, how the devil uses to get people to, to, be, to disobey God. Uh, with that law, 
it kind of gives to us a guideline okay, this morning to how to go about um, doing things, how to go about understanding things. Okay, in Proverbs, when it speaks about remove not the ancient landmarks. In the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, it tells us don't remove the ancient landmarks. Landmarks are objects on land that serve as a guide from a distance. From a far distance, that landmark will help guide you to where uh, you want to go or where your destination is. The Bible is a book of landmarks. And likewise, the law of first mention. Another example, the first time blood is mentioned. It is mentioned when Cain killed Abel. And from that time forth, that first time when blood is shed, when blood is spilled out, becomes like the guide throughout the pages of the Bible until even the time of Jesus Christ, that when he died for the sins of the world, Okay, he has blood has to be shed. Okay, like Cain and Abel, when Cain killed Abel, blood shed. Blood came out from his body and it becomes the guideline in the way uh, throughout the entire Bible. Hebrews 9.22 And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And it's like throughout the whole Bible until Jesus, Jesus had to shed blood. Blood has to come out from his body to uh, forgive the sins of mankind. Now for the word Christian, if we use the law of first mention to get an understanding about who is a Christian, it will be here in Antioch in Acts chapter 11 verse 26. And the disciples will call Christians first or were first called Christians in Antioch. And when we begin, when we begin to connect all the uh, dots together in a way, the nine words together in verse number 26, these nine words, we find that when the first time the word Christians was used, they were referred to as disciples. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The Christians there in Antioch the first time, they were not called mentors. They were not called influencers. They were not called teachers and they may be teachers, they were not even called pastors. They were not called Sunday school teachers first, lecturers, doctors, musicians, reverends, brother. The first time okay, uh, the word Christian appear and and when it appeared the first time, they were referred to as disciples. The word Christian is the word followers of Christ. These followers of Christ uh, were called or referred to as disciples. And as a follower of Christ, they all have a, have a D word. Or maybe like this, you know, have this... Uh, word volunteer here but uh, for them it is disciples they have this word disciples kind of embossed into their spiritual wear okay and uh, wherever they go if you could see their spiritual wear you see embossed at the back is this word disciple they were Christians but they were disciples and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They were all disciples first. And likewise, everyone who this morning when asked about your belief, and when you begin to pan it down, or when you begin to say who you are this morning, or when you begin to pan it down on that empty space that say, what is your belief, or what is your religion? And when you say you're a Christian, you are saying this morning that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, this brings us this morning to the question of 
Who is a disciple? And I'm going to look at this this morning because this is important for you and I who are Christians. And the first thing about a disciple or a Christian is he's a loyalist. He's a loyalist of the highest order. And he display his highest devotion to his king, to Jesus Christ, above all else. In the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 26, Luke writes these words, the words of Jesus, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife, and children and brothers and sisters yes and even his own life he cannot be my disciple if you begin to emboss also the word Christian on top of the word disciple or bracket the word Christian next to it you will read he cannot be my Christian or he cannot be a Christian Jesus Christ there is not saying we are to literally hate our parents. He's not saying that. Because it will contradict the other scriptures that teach us to honor, to respect our parents. Jesus Christ is not saying to neglect our children. For we are taught from the word of God to bring them up under the instruction of the word of God. Jesus Christ is not saying to hate your wife. But because the Bible says to love her. Husband, love your wife. He's not saying about hate as in that form. But rather what he's saying to you this morning. Is he's saying to you that he must be your highest love. He must be our highest loyalty he must come first over other relationships all other relationship must not even be equal to him or above him all other relationship have to come under he has to be number one in john chapter 3 verse 30 to 31 john the baptist when seeing jesus he say to those around him, he must increase, but I must decrease. He that come from above, he says, is above all. Verse 31, John says, he that come from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speak of the earth, but he that come from heaven is above all. The disciples who were first Christians in Antioch exhibit a character and that is to them a character of loyal display and that display of loyalty is that Jesus Christ is above all else okay all other relationship he must always be our number one the second characteristics of a Christian or disciple is he carries his own cross daily. Luke 14, 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus say unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me a cross this morning has two beams to it okay one horizontal one vertical the first beam is called the will of god the second beam is called his own will and what it is what it is is you it means you allow the will of God to cross your will. You have your own will. You have your own will to decide to choose. But carrying the cross means this morning you allow the cross to cross your own will. 
It is denying your will and accepting the will of God in this cross. It usually comes with a daily cost to it. Every day, because we are called to carry our cross every day, daily. Every morning when you wake up from your sleep, you are called to take up your cross and follow Jesus. A cross is a picture of death. When a criminal is to be crucified, they will first place his cross on him and he would carry that cross to the place where he would be crucified like Jesus. They place a cross on him and he would have to carry his cross okay, to the place where he would be crucified. Okay. Once the cross is laid on him, it is a one-way journey. This morning, this is a one-way journey. Amen. Amen. You cannot look back. Amen. You cannot turn back. You must not allow your eyes to look to the left nor to the right. It is a one-way journey. Okay. In that journey, you are called not to look back. Okay. You are to go forward. And the picture there of carrying the cross or bearing the cross is a picture of being subjected this morning to all kinds of attack. If we have that imagery of Jesus carrying the cross on that day 2,000 years ago, in that imagery of Jesus having to bear the cross himself, it is his cross. But that cross is for all. At the end of the day, many come because of through him to get saved. But if you have that imagery, okay, that he's carrying the cross, people that surrounds him, there were people mocking at him. There were people begin to speak words against him. There were people begin to begin to criticize. There were people begin probably there were people throwing stones at him, laughing at him. And the picture there of carrying the cross or bearing the cross is a picture of being subjected to all kinds of this morning afflictions that come from carrying the cross. The pain can range from all kinds of affliction, from to sorrow, to grief, for to some imprisonment, okay, like for Paul and Silas. Because they carry the cross and they begin to tell people that the only way is through this cross, through Christ. The only way okay, is through the word of God. The only way is Jesus. They were beaten. They were put in prison. They were put in chain. And, and if you this morning, because of living for Christ or begin, because of standing for Christ or because of obeying Christ's word this morning, finds yourself coming under spiritual attack. Peter says in the Bible, do not think this is a strange thing. Do not think, what is happening to me? Why am I going through these things? I thought when I become a Christian and, then, and I begin to pray and I begin to fast and I begin to read the Bible, I begin to tell people about Jesus, I begin to live a holy life, I begin to put Him first. Well, I'm, I thought I'm supposed to be, have a smooth journey. I thought I'm going to have you know, a, a journey that has no problems, but it's not so. Because a, a cross that we carry, it, it, it gives a picture of one, a picture that is in a way that um, you may, you, you will go through some kind of uh, afflictions or uh, a pain. There was there's a sister here that uh, two years back, I think, uh, she put Christ first. In all the things that she does, she always put Christ first. Okay, no dinner, no family uh, uh, gathering. Whenever it comes to time to be in the house of the Lord, uh, she will always put Jesus first. 
and put the house of God first. And, and she finds herself having to carry a cross in the way, bear the cross, bear the pain of the cross. Her family did not uh, 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 begin to kind of uh, welcome her, her faithfulness, well, see her. Her family begin, did not begin to you know, appreciate her love for Jesus Christ. They disown her. They begin to throw her things out from the house and put the things that she has in, near the garbage area you know, and, and have nothing to do with her. She bared the cross. Her cross was she was disowned, rejected, even had her belongings thrown out of the house. Bearing the cross this morning is a decision that you're going to deny self, deny self-will. Okay. And you understand this morning in that cross, there will be at times, they're going to be hate going to come against you. Okay. There will be hate coming against you. But this morning, you have made a decision. It's a one-way journey. Amen. And you're going to look towards that one-way journey. You're going to look to it. Okay, conducted the funeral last, last week, is it? This week. And, and again, I took the uh, message from James chapter 4 that says that life is a vapor. Okay, here today, here for a moment, and in a moment of time, disappear okay took from that and begin to speak about a life that would need to put self will self aside and begin to follow the will of God okay. and this morning each and every one of us this morning has to live a life this morning, understanding that part of the journey may not be all that smooth. You may find yourself, when you begin to stand for Jesus, begin to tell people about Jesus and live for Jesus, you may find yourself uh, having a cross to carry and there's no shame carrying your cross. Amen. Amen. Jesus you know, no shame carrying your cross. Jesus, your Savior, He carried His cross for you and I. The third thing about a Christian or disciple is he considered all that he has belonging to God. In Luke chapter 14, verse 33, Jesus says that, So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. There's no question here that what he's saying there is kind of like jaw-dropping. You're like, huh? You know, uh, telling me to give up all my possession is like his, their eyes, I think, will all bulge up, you know. When Jesus says, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions or who does not forsake. To forsake means to say goodbye. Goodbye to what you have. It means when the time comes. It means when the time comes between two masters. That is the master of mammon, or the master of money, and the master of God himself. To forsake all, it means you, when the time comes, between money and between God. What he's saying is to you, is that you forsake money, you forsake mammon, and you choose God. If there is a choice, when the choice comes, set before you, placed before you, and you have to choose between God 
and money. What Jesus is saying to you from that scripture is that you have to choose Him. You got to choose God and not mammon. You cannot have two masters. Hello? You cannot have two gods. Because one is a false god. One is a true god. The false god is mammon, money. Money is a false god. You cannot have two gods. You can only have one. And one is a true god. The other one is a false god. In Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. There's no in-between line. You have to choose one. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. You have to choose one. And the disciple is one when it's placed before you okay, to decide which to choose. You are to choose God and not mammon. To forsake all is not talking about of becoming poor. It's not talking about you do not, uh, you cannot have a house. It's not talking about this morning you're sleeping on, on, on car, in car box, you know. It's not talking about go around begging for food or, or wearing, you know, torn shoes and, and torn pants. It's not talking about that. But rather, it's talking about getting your cor priorities correct. Getting, having a correct priorities. It's about seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. How many know God will take care of you? Amen. When you put Him first, when your king is your number one, above all, okay? And in your above all, you may find yourself, you know what, in pain or all that, but you put him first, and he knows how to add unto you. All these things that you are concerned about, he too is concerned for you. But when you put him first, he will add unto you. He will supernaturally add to you. He's a supernatural pro providing God. Amen. Amen. He sent ravens to feed Elijah. Morning and night. He has western food. Morning and night. Meat in the morning. Meat at night. I'm not sure about his cholesterol. But he has meat in the morning. Meat at night. And he just sit down there. And the birds will bring. Ravens will bring. Maybe he will have deer meat one day. And then the other day will have... Uh, uh, mouse deer or something like that or have uh, uh, pork meat or, or, or cow or cattle you know maybe have exotic some exotic meat you know frogs you know, I don't know <laughs> but oh yeah he God provides for him when you begin to understand that you cannot have two masters. Whatever your master is mastering over you, okay, you can only have one master. And your God has to be that master and no other master. Because all other masters are false masters. Another character of a Christian or a disciple, it is... He is filled with God's love for God and for one another. In 1 John 3, 19, John has this to say. We love because He first loved us. We're able to love. And in that love, it contains many things. Okay, we understand 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is so many things there. The love chapter. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love is forgiving. 
Love does not boast, love does not envy, and love bear all things, believe all things. Love is this. And we are able to love because He first loved us. God loved us. Moreover, in John 14, verse 15, Jesus says to His disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The badge of a disciple is he wear the badge of love. Jesus sums it up in the, the entire Old Testament in two commandments in Mark chapter 12. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then to love your neighbors as yourself. And John has this to say about what love is in 1 John 4, 20 to 21. If someone says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God, should love his brother also. John is saying, how can you say you love God, okay, whom you have not seen? And you say you hate your brothers whom you have seen with your eyes. How can you say you love God whom you have not seen, but yet between your brothers and sisters, you have a hatred for them and say you love God? Whom you have not seen with your eyes. As a disciple, again, this is the badge you wear. Okay. For again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the words of Paul Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love. I become a sounding brass, a clinking cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. It does sounds like love when you begin to read verse, you know, two to verse number three, you know. Give all my give all my goods to feed the poor. Even give my body to be burned. I mean, wow, there is there is something to give all. But yet he says that you, it's possible you have not love. You, there's no love in you even though you, you begin to do all this. And he began to go on to explain what love is. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, is not jealous. Love does not boast itself. Okay. It's not boastful. It's not puff up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoke. Things no evil. It does not rejoice in sin when someone falls. When someone fails, you don't clap your hands and you don't say serve you right for fall. Serve you. You, you don't. You become sad even when someone who's evil fall you're not happy that they fall you are grieved by it but love rejoice in truth love bear all things believes all things hope all things endure all things love never fails and who is a christian Christian is a disciple and 
What is a disciple? He's a man of God's love, a woman of God's love. The fifth thing about a disciple or Christian is he's a man or woman of prayer. Someone has this to say about what prayer is. And prayer, he says, is not about fulfilling your wish list. I do understand that we have a wish, wish list. Okay? This is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. I mean, it's all, yes, there's, there's part of it. But what prayer is, is prayer is about joining our hearts with the heart of God. Prayer is joining your heart with God's heart. You are linking yourself with the heart of God. Okay, you're connecting when you pray with the heart of God. The disciples of Jesus understood the importance of prayer. And they one day went before the Lord and said to the Lord, teach me or teach us to pray. And then Jesus began to teach them. And even more so, they understand the importance of what you call intercessory prayer. That is other people. needs to be in their wish list. Is other people in your wish list? Do you have other people inside your wish list when you pray? Do you have your family, your church members, are they in your wish list? Is it, or is just all about what you want? Not saying it's wrong, but it's not complete when it is all about uh, your wish list. Romans 15, verse 30. It says, Now I urge you, brethren. By our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, the strive in me together in your prayers to God for me. Oswald Chamber, renowned pastors in the 1800s, my utmost for his highest in his book say, Prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. Prayer itself is the greater work. E.M. Bound say what the church needs today is not more machinery, not better organization, not many clever methods, but men or women whom the Holy Ghost can use. There is men and women of mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men and women. He does not anoint missionaries. He does not anoint things, but he anoints people. And he anoints men and women of prayer. A disciple of Jesus Christ is a man and woman that prays. Another character is he is committed to spread the good news. God did not send angels to spread the good news. He sent you and I. 
Romans 10, 15, how beautiful. You want to have beautiful feet? How many wants beautiful feet? <laughs> how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You want to have beautiful feet? Go and preach the gospel. Amen. Tell people about Jesus and Him dying on the cross for our sins. Mark 16, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the last point is He is someone who is humble. He has a master key that he, he wears, he holds with him. It opens all the locks. That's what master key is. One key opening all kinds of locks. And that master key is that this disciple have with him is the master key of humility. Humbleness, humility is confidence place in the right place. Your confidence, my confidence have to be placed in the right place. And that right place is in God Himself. Pride is confidence placed in yourself. Pride is placing your confidence in yourself and not on God. And the Bible warns us about pride. Pride goes before destruction. Pride, pride goes before a fall. If our confidence is not in God in all that we do, okay, we are living in pride. Both Peter and James has this to say, God is opposed to the proud. But God gives grace to the humble. To the humble, He gives grace. He gives favor. And we all need favor, amen. amen. If you stay humble, stay dependent to the living God. You go to Him. You pray. You acknowledge Him every day in your life. The day we were in prayer talking about Nehemiah, he heard bad news took place back home. He was very disturbed. And the king took note of him being so down. The king says, Nehemiah, what happened to you today? And I could see from your face that, you know what, your heart, there's something hurting inside you. Nehemiah, what is going on? You know, and the king says to him, what can I do to help? How can I help you? And in, in those few short words, he says, And Nehemiah, pray to the Lord. Short prayer. I mean, it would be like, you know, the king is asking you, what do you want? Is there anything I can help? And this man, the Bible says, in that short moment, he prayed. He prayed to the Lord. He looked to the Lord. He asked the Lord. And the next thing happened is that he began to talk to the king. And, and God began to move upon the king's heart and began to grant him, began to grant him the things that he need. Confidence. Humility. is about putting your confidence in the right place. You know what? The devil doesn't want you to put your confidence in the right place. He doesn't want you, and one of the ways he gets you is he doesn't want you to pray. That's why Paul says, you know, strive to pray. Because the devil knows that if you pray, if he, if he sees you praying, if he sees you on your knees, if he sees you begin to look to God, he knows he's in big trouble. He knows that he's in more trouble. He knows you will begin to have favor from the Almighty God. God begin to lead you and, and guide you. Humility is about knowing where your confidence is. 
not on yourself. Yes, you may be. I mean, here's a man, cup, cup bearer of the king. Close to the king. Probably know a lot of things about. Next to the king, when someone sees him, he, oh, they always see, hey, Nehemiah is next to the king. Dress. Smart, dress. Probably have a high salary because, you know. But the Bible says about this man, when the time comes to place confidence, he does not place his confidence on his connection. I have connection with the king. The king knows me and I knows the king. And I, it looks like the king likes me. He did not place his confidence in his connection. But the Bible tells us when the king asks, what do you want? He looks up to heaven and he say a prayer. He understands that everything that he has must come from God, need to come from God. It's a gift from God and must continue to be from God. Amen. And he understand this morning that if he's going to receive from God, he has to have a humble heart before him. He has to begin his day with prayer, end his day with thanksgiving. And in between those days, from morning to evening, when the question is asked, what do you want? He will bow his head and begin to ask God first, God, I need you to help me in this very, very area that I'm going through. I want to close with being a person of discipline. To be a Christian is to be a disciple. And to be a disciple, you have to discipline yourself. Amen. Those two words sound very similar, isn't it? Disciple, discipline, discipline, disciple. Okay. It's like this is mentioned in the book of First Corinthians, chapter nine, verse twenty-seven, whereby twenty-four to twenty-seven, whereby Paul begins to speak about the Christian life is is like an athlete or even like a boxer. Okay. And he says in verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race, in a race, who run in a race, run, all run, but only one receive the prize? And then he began to tell us, run in such a way. Here's the way, Paul says. Here's the way to how to be a disciple. Here's the way how to be a Christian. And, and this is the way. Run in such a way. Run in such a way that you may win, not lose. He says, you must run to win. You must run to finish the line. You must run at the end of the day to stand before your Lord and Savior and have Him say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. You must have that in your mind. You must run to win. You must have a focus. You cannot run to lose. You must run to win. You set your mind on winning. That goal price, that finishing line, you want to run to that finishing line. You must have a focus to run as a runner, as an athlete. Run in such a way that you may win everyone who competes in the game. And then he begins to say, exercise self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable reef. Let's talk about the world. But we, an imperishable, something that would not die, but live forever. This is our price. A life, a living life, a beautiful life, a joyful life that's forever. Therefore, I run in such a way, Paul says, as not without aim. I box in such a way. I run in such a way. I box in such a way. And I box in such a way, I'm not beating the air. 
I'm hitting something. Maybe hitting the devil on the left, hitting him on the right, hitting him underneath, hitting him on top. You know, I box in such a way as not beating there. But I discipline my body. I make my body a slave. I'm not letting my body become my master. You must not let your body become your master. Will you say amen? amen. Your body, this body of ours, is always anti-Christ. How many you know? If we talk about anti-Christ there, anti-Christ there, anti this body also. <laughs> it's, this body of ours are rebellious, you know. Anti-Christ. It doesn't want you to serve God. It doesn't want you to be in the presence of God. He wants to go somewhere else. You know, he wants to be in somewhere else. It, 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 it wants something. It goes against your spirit, man. The things that I want to do, I find myself cannot do. But the things that I don't want to do, I, I find myself wanting to do. And that thing that you do not want to do is this fellow. Lah. This fellow is saying, uh, do this. This flesh thing is very nice, you know. Uh, feed your flesh, you know. Take care of flesh, you know. But the spirit things, ah, no need to pray, you know. No need to read the Bible. No need to fast. No need to, you know. Don't do all those things. Don't worship God. No, don't don't be in church. Okay, uh, be somewhere else. This flesh is. Paul himself. Man that went out, went up to paradise three times, seen and heard things that many have not heard and seen. He understood his own body. I too have to make my body a slave. I cannot let my body be my master. My master is Jesus. Amen. Your master must be Jesus. He must be your number one. Your body cannot be the number one. If you let your body be the number one, you may find yourself, like Paul says, but I discipline my body and I make it my slave. My body is not my master. It's my slave. It is meant to serve me serve Jesus I wanted to serve Jesus I wanted to serve my relationship with Jesus Amen and it says so that after I preach to others I myself will not be disqualified now I'm not saying that I myself may not be saved but may be disqualified from the rewards that God has for him if he will not to discipline his body as a disciple you are a disciple it's not me who say you are a disciple it's the bible that says if you are a christian you are a disciple sorry okay. you are a disciple and as a disciple you have to discipline your body and make your body to serve your Lord this morning. So as I bring this to a close this morning, Acts 11.26 And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The thing is not whether you are a Christian. The thing is this morning, are you a disciple? Are we a disciple? Because the Christians there, they are called disciples. And in their discipling, discipleship, relationship, they have a relationship with their king with their master with their lord amen one every head bow
Every eyes closed this morning. Who is a Christian this morning? The title? Or what is a Christian? A Christian is simply a disciple. And this morning, we heard all the points about what makes a disciple a disciple. He prays, he disciplines his body, he put Christ first. Christ is prior. All other relationship he puts below Christ. spread the good news he shared the gospel and the Bible tells us this morning in plain black words and the disciples will call Christians first in Antioch I would like you to stand to your feet and if God is speaking to you want to open the altars you come to the altars and maybe you say you know what uh, it's hard but I want you to know the Holy Spirit can help you as we heard humility is the key humility is placing confidence in God say to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to humble myself before you this morning. I need your help to become a disciple. Because this is the identity of a Christian. He's a disciple. She's a disciple. Lord, make us all disciples here. Holy Spirit, empower us to be a disciple. Mold us to be a disciple. Renew our minds that we have a disciple mind. Hallelujah. Lord, fall upon us. Lord, fall upon us this morning. Saturate each and every one of us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, hallelujah. Fill with thy spirit. Like a 
want you to stand to your feet. I want you to stand where you are and lift up your hands. And I believe the Holy Ghost is going to fall on you this morning as you stand. We need the Holy Spirit to say amen. The Bible tells us they will fill the Holy Spirit. And after that, they begin to take the world for Jesus. Let's pray, Holy Spirit, this morning. Fall on all of us this morning. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, fill us all this morning. Fill your people here. Hallelujah, Spirit of the living God. Fill my sister. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, Shiki Yondo Sunday. Fill us, sister. Let your power flow on each and every one of them. In the name of Jesus, Aranda Rabasanda, fill your people. Iolo lolo robo sanda riba sanda spirit of the living God. We are the sanda. Hallelujah. Anda kara baba feel your sister. Hallelujah. Feel thy grace, spirit of the living God. In the name of Jesus, Siki anda kara baba feel my sister. Oh Lord, I think that Siki anda kara baba sanda. Feel my brother in the name of Jesus. song before we uh, continue on. Holy Spirit, uh, go back to your uh, seats and sing this song. Oh, Holy Ghost, your wonderful God, your strong blowing wind is blowing from heaven. Holy Ghost, Holy Wind blowing down 
shall go And soldiers in the army With fiery heart and soul Let's give the big clap to the Lord So uh, today is uh, Dinesh's birthday. Let's sing him a song. Okay, one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Dinesh. Happy birthday to you. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless Dinesh. May the good God bless you. Let's pray for him. Father, we pray for him. Come, let's pray for you. Let's pray for him. Father in heaven, commit our brother to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, um, you brought him here even from the very beginning. And, and Lord, you have uh, blessed him, transformed him as you um, know and we know he was a uh, man of timidity but you begin to build him up place confidence in him and transform his life we give thanks to you for, for all that and this morning we ask of your divine blessing upon him your divine favor upon him hallelujah guide him in all things and give thanks to you for this very day in Jesus Christ's name we pray Amen, Amen. Amen. Bless you,